Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Hat Gaming Man here, and today I am in the Retro Man Cave with Neil. Welcome to the cave. Thank you. Can I call yes. you Neil? Is that you okay? You can call me Neil, yes. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> so, so Neil, what is this, um, you've got a YouTube channel, just in case you don't know this already. Um, so what exactly sort of channel do you run? Would you call it a, a whitening channel? <laughs> there is a lot of whitening that takes place, yeah. My channel is called Retro Man Cave, and it's really an adventure in all things retro, mostly computers, although we do branch out sometimes into other things like toys and laser discs and things like that. Um, and yes, the whitening that you refer to is the retro brighting process, which is part of the Trash to Treasure series, which happens sometimes where we get broken old machines and we try to restore them to their former glory. Oh, okay. Personally, I've always preferred um, for a traditional, more yellow colour. Yeah. Based yeah. on the fact that if it's yellow, then it's clearly been out and played and loved. So it's got a lot it's of a character very good to it. Point. So I, I enjoy the yellowness. Yeah, so there are a lot of system. arguments for and against. Sure, um, there are. Both from that side of things, and also some people th say that uh, retro writing will re-yellow. So what's the point? I don't know, each to their own. Yes, live and let yes. live, I say. So obviously with this being a, my channel, that is, being a gaming channel, um, mm -hmm. what's your favourite gaming platform? It has to be the Amiga for me. Not yeah. one particular model, but the whole series of Amiga computers. Just because they're the computers that I had as a teenager that were that are really closest to my heart. So and They are very impressive for their time, aren't they? I'd they say. are. Like, they're so impressive. Like When you consider like the Amiga 500 was out at the same time as people was playing on Master Systems and NESs, yeah. the Amiga's a different level mm. altogether. It is, the Amiga 500 is basically a spin-off of the Amiga 1000, which was out in 1985. Exactly. You, you imagine some of the things that you see the Amiga doing in 1985. It's it literally insane. Hat so what's it all about then, really? Why do you feel that um, the Amiga range never seemed to catch on in the United States, despite being so powerful and such superior gaming hardware mm -hmm. to anything else on the market? Why mm -hmm. do you think that was? And also being an American company. Exactly. Commodore. <laughs> so, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, does they, it? they just went for that weak it Nintendo yeah. platform instead. Um, what, what happened? I think there are a couple of reasons. One is just business savvy. They just didn't get it right in America, especially on the marketing side of things. For some reason, in, in Europe especially, they really nailed the marketing with things like the bundles, like the cartoon classics and, and packs like that. They really got it right, whereas in America, I think they tried to aim it more at the educational market because that's okay. traditionally what happened with microcomputers over there. Yes. For gaming, it was all about the consoles. Was the it? Amiga itself um, in the UK and other European um, countries ever marketed specifically as something great for gaming, do you know? Or did people just kind of adopt it as a great gaming platform? It, it took a while even in Europe for Commodore to promote it as a gaming machine, but there was always that element in the packs of gaming, like the cartoon classics pack. Yes, yes. It would have some games, but it would have deluxe paint to have that educational element, which of course gave us as kids and teenagers an excuse to go, well, mum, I can use it for my schoolwork. Yeah, exactly. Which of course you it's never did. Lie, lie, yes. <laughs> Yeah, but, but yeah, um, it was well ahead of its time, but at the same time it wasn't. In those later Amigas, they set such a precedent with the Amiga 500 being so ahead of its time, they couldn't follow it up. So we've um, talked about the Amiga 500 and the Amiga 1000. Mm. What about the Amiga 32, well, Amiga CD32? CD32 What's here? this all about? So we're in the middle of a Trash to Treasure series at the moment. This arrived in the cave in two parts. Um, so we had to put it back together, recap it, find a problem with the composite output, and we go through all that process in, in the first two parts. And then in the final part, which is coming up in the next week or so, we're going to play games, lots and lots of games. Oh, excellent. We're going to put add-ons into it, and we're going to see all of the things that we can do with the CD32. It's the last machine to come out of Commodore before they went bankrupt. And some say it's the best Amiga to get hold of just for the convenience of being able to play games on it. Yes. You can just throw a CD in and you're away rather than having to play around with WHD load and hard drives and things I like that. I am very tempted to procure one of these myself, mm. um, simply for the fact that if you look, it's got those, what are those called on the back? Yeah, I'm it's got the composite it. out and the phono audio, but it's also got an S video out, which gives a great picture. So this would be great for like, if I want to stream it on Twitch, for example, I'll be able to bang, hook it straight up um, to the capture card. And, I'll be able to play the Amiga CD32 on stream. Absolutely, and if you can find the French release, you get an 8-pin instead of a 4-pin S video. Oh, okay. So you can get a really nice picture from that. Yeah, very nice machine. And you've got a few games here. What I Another thing I like about this, and why I'm so leaning towards getting one, is uh, you've got no copy protection on the system, Absolutely. have you? So um, <clears throat> No copy protection. Um, 
it's really hard to say how many games there are for the CD32. There are of course the official ones of 170 or so, but as you say, you can just copy games and those games can be repackaged Amiga 500 or Amiga 1200 games. So that opens you up to that whole library. Any idea how big that library is off the top of your head? No, no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like just to even hazard a guess. Either, you know, when you include public domain releases as well, it's just tens and tens of thousands. Uh, you can add a floppy disk to it. So you can just put Amiga 500, 1200 disks in. You can add huge units to the, to the back of it, which we're gonna do in part three to turn it into a fully blown Amiga 1200 with keyboard, mouse, monitor, printer, so, everything. So, you, you know, the, the amount of games out there are phenomenal. So things. really, this system has like an outrageous upside to it. Like, for some reason, I hear people talking more about um, the real 3DO and the Philips CDI more than I hear about this thing. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that could be the case? Why? Uh, because it was only around for such a small amount of time. It was released late 1990. Uh, three, I think, and by mid-94 it, it, Commodore had gone bust and, and they didn't sell anymore. But in that short space of time they did sell 100,000 units in Europe. So it was destined for great things, I think, at least until the PlayStation would have come along. So I, I've got a semi-good chance of managing to get one of these for cheap if I look mm, hard enough. They're not cheap. Uh, you were complaining about the prices at Play Expo Blackboard They was outrageous, recently, yes. You? Disgusting prices. I saw one there for £400. I did too and I laughed. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I was offered yeah. one earlier that week for 300 so that's why I found it. Yeah. I reckon it might have even been the same one, perhaps. There's a chance. Well, be on the lookout for broken ones. You never know, I might be able to fix one up for you if That's you really quality. come across one Thank at a good price. So, yeah. But um, also with regards to this system, I've covered in a recent video on my channel about a period in time which fell between 1993 and 1995, which I like to refer to as the second video game crash because mm. so many um, companies fell out of the console race altogether. Amiga was one of them along with um, Philips. Um, Panasonic, um, Sega took major damage which you could equate plan a factor into their eventual demise with the 32X, uh, the Nomad, um, mm -hmm. the Mega CD and even the Sega Saturn as well to Absolutely. some degree and, and that list just goes on and on. Obviously you've got, you've got the Palladia as well and just all sorts of gaming platforms you don't hear a lot about. I must admit anymore. I haven't heard of the Palladia. Yes, no. Exactly, <laughs> um, the Bandai Pippin as well, yeah, so many. Like, Pippin, it's, yeah. So I suppose these consoles, they get overlooked somewhat because there was such an abundance of consoles at the time. So even if they was really good, mm. then it might not get the credit it deserves. So do you think the Amiga CD32 might be one of those consoles? Does it get yeah. too much flack? I, I think it might be. Um, I did watch that video that you mentioned with great interest. I've never thought of it as a second video game crash, but it makes perfect sense the way you explained it in your video. And I think this does get totally wrapped up in that period and all of those problems. And the other problem it had, along with some of those other consoles, not all of them, was they completely forgot about exclusives on the Amiga CD32. When it came out, there were games like Battle Chess from 1988. Okay. Um, it came so it's a bit like a Nintendo Switch. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. It came out with Oscar and Diggers, which were really... It wasn't. They weren't console games. They weren't going to compete with the Sonic the Hedgehogs of the, the yes, Mario's yes, of the yes. world. So, as a standalone platform in its day, it was pretty, it was a bad decision. Mm. But with hindsight now and with access to that massive library of games, it's a great collector's piece, I think, and a great gaming machine. What do you think of the controller? Uh, different. Yeah, it's like, um, it's a bit awkward to hold, isn't it? Um, and I've actually got a, a brand new controller because these things are not cheap. You'll be looking at 45, 40 pound to buy one of these original controllers. No wonder this is so much then. <coughs> you absolutely a boxed one. Um, but in the next part of the video, we'll be looking at um, a guy on Amibay who makes brand new controllers, which are more in the SNES style. Okay, which that's are quite nice to play with. Like so I'll be showing people them, and um, hopefully they won't be as expensive as, as those to get hold of. Yeah. Okay, one more question before we before we wrap up. Graphically, what's the system like? Like, if you compare it to like more mainstream platforms, where would you place it? Um, well, obviously, it's basically an Amiga 1200 at its heart. So, if you know what the Amiga 1200s are like, then graphically, there it has a bit of a hangover to those 2D days. There's certainly no custom 3D hardware in there. So, if there's a huge divide between this and the Saturn and the PlayStation era. So graphically, so no cheesy FMV games on this one. Like, yes, there is cheesy oh. FMV games like Microcosm, which is essentially 
a, a really simple shoot 'em up. It's a wound explorer, isn't it? Exactly. That's how it feels yeah, to me when absolutely. I play this. Flying around the human body, and there's an FMV module that you can slide inside it to improve the quality. Um, it can also play those CDI FMV movies, and, and um, oh, I've got a lot of those. So. Yeah, and karaoke discs and things like that. So yeah, it is of the era of FMV and you, you know those full motion adventure games that um, they really try to push, but. They so, never quite worked. Did on they? the bright side, I suppose there's a lot of variety. Then a huge amount of variety Absolutely. when you when you take into account um, the Amiga microcomputer libraries as well. So yeah, variety and convenience. I think it's a, the perfect Amiga package, really. Excellent. So um, I've been a top hack gaming man. This is Neil from Retro Man Cave, and I would strongly advise you subscribe to his channel if you've never heard of him before, because he creates some quality content. So I advise you all to check it out. Let us know in the comment section if you've had any experiences with the Amiga CD32 or um, whether you're like myself and haven't actually got round to playing it yet. If you haven't played it yet, would you like to give it a go? Let me know in the comment section. Don't forget to like and subscribe as well for regular in-depth content if you are yet to do so. Cheerio! Cheerio! Special activity.